begin this morning with uh, the words of the psalmist, Psalm 5, excuse me, Book 5, Psalm 118, verse 23 and 24. This is the Lord's doing. Uh, it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice uh, and be glad in it. Uh, we also begin this morning certainly with uh, not only our thoughts but our prayers uh, focused upon those who are in the past, uh, now Hurricane Milton, uh, and those who are still recovering uh, from Hurricane uh, Helene. And so I just want to encourage you uh, as uh, this very gigantic storm approaches uh, the coast of, uh, of Florida, uh, that we be in prayer for those uh, who are in harm's uh, way. Uh, and also first uh, responders uh, in emergency uh, personnel. Uh, as we move into our Bible study on the day, I want to thank you for certainly joining us. Uh, as always, it is an excitement and a delight uh, to share uh, the Word of God with uh, the people of God, both the members of uh, First Baptist Church North Tulsa uh, and also our uh, virtual guests. Our text selection for today uh, in our Bible study is coming from the Gospel of St. Mark, uh, Mark being the second book of the New Testament, uh, the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 4. Uh, we're going to be focused on verses 1 through 9, the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 4, uh, focusing our attention uh, on, excuse me, uh, excuse me, not Mark chapter 4, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, we are focused uh, on Mark chapter 11, uh, verses 22 uh, and 24. I'm going to throw you a little curveball there. Mark 11, uh, verses 22 uh, and 24. Uh, I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible, uh, and it reads as follows. So Jesus, so Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he asks. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. Thus endeth uh, the reading uh, of the word uh, of the Lord. Uh, and again, our, our thought for today in our Bible study is the power, uh, the power of faith. Power of faith. Um, I'm often making reference to a particular book, uh, and that book is entitled What is Faith? Uh, written by Dr. J. Gresham uh, McShann. I've quoted from this book quite often uh, particularly when I'm dealing with the subject uh, of faith. But Dr. J. Gresham McShann, in his book entitled What is Faith, uh, deals very extensively with uh, this, this biblical idea uh, of faith. In chapter 4, specifically, he talks about faith that is born of need. And he says, Jesus is one in whom that we can trust. Jesus foundationally is someone in whom that you and I can trust. Uh, there are no limits to his goodness, and there are also no limits to uh, his power. But that in and of itself is not sufficient basis for faith. In other words, no matter how great or good the Savior is, and we know that the Savior is both great, good, uh, and powerful, we cannot trust him or place our trust in him uh, unless there be some contact specifically between him and us, all right? Uh, in other words, in order uh, for faith to move to uh, the level of trust, in order for faith uh, to be put into action, uh, there must be some connection, some specific contact between uh, Jesus and us, right? Now, when we push that even further, uh, faith in a person involves not merely co the conviction uh, that that person that we are placing our trust in is able, but also the conviction that that person we place our trust in is willing. Uh, th there is uh, a distinction, and they go hand in hand, right? 
uh, two sides of the same coin, both uh, the ability of God and also the willingness of God, right? Uh, in, in theological terms, we, we talk about uh, the transcendence and the eminence of God, the transcendence of God being uh, that God is greater than us, right? That God uh, is majestic, that, that, that God is sovereign, that, 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 that we are not certainly God, that, that, that there is a rock that is higher than us. But then the eminence of God speaks to the, the nearness, the nearness of God, right? That we uh, are able uh, to come into his presence. We're able uh, to feel his presence, that, that God is willing and able to hear and to answer prayer. So when we talk about uh, the, the ability of God, right, uh, that, that is one thing. But then we also talk about uh, the, the willingness of God. There must be some definite relation between the person trusted and a specific need of the person who trusts, right? Uh, in, in the great text of the Bible, uh, dealing with uh, this particular uh, portion uh, of the Gospel of St. Mark, Mark 11, uh, 22 through uh, 24, there's the idea that, that, that we must believe and also receive. In other words, uh, it, it draws really the idea of believing and receiving a, a connection between promise and prayer, right? A connection between his promises and our uh, prayer, right? In other words, uh, that, that's how uh, that, that coming together uh, between us and God uh, can take place. Uh, God makes the promise, we pray, and, and there becomes a connection, right, between uh, his promise and our prayer, right? This uh, recognition of our need, and then even the utterance of that need uh, in prayer, right? Uh, we, we, we ought to pray, uh, certainly, and to ask God uh, for things. But uh, as we are praying, uh, that there becomes this connection between Jesus and us, a connection between faith, right, uh, and, and, and trust, between his promises and our prayers. We ought to believe that, that God, we are to believe that God has answered our prayer, right? Uh, and this belief that God... Uh, answers and hears our prayers rest on a, a number of factors. It rests on the fact that we have faith in God as the fountain of, of all good. That 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 every good and every perfect thing, as it says in James one and seventeen, uh, comes from above. That God is the fountain of all good. That God has something good for us and is willing to give it. But then uh, that there must also be a harmony. Uh, uh, between our request, right, uh, and the will of God. And this text will certainly bear that out. But then also, uh, on our part, uh, understand that God has perfect freedom, right, in the use of ways and means, right? We want to believe, we want to receive, we want there to be a connection between his promise and our prayers, specifically when it is born of need. We, we desire something, we need something, we crave something, we want something, we need God to do something miraculous in our life, but we must understand that God has the freedom to use ways and means according uh, to, to his sovereignty and not according to how we want to see things transpire uh, in our life, right? We shall know that we have obtained uh, what we ask when we act on the belief that we have obtained it, and when we uh, see that we have uh, obtained certainly uh, what we are desiring uh, of God. And so I've asked you many times just to simply be able to explain maybe in a sentence or two how you in your own uh, life would define uh, this idea, concept uh, of, uh, of faith. But moving further, looking uh, at the power of faith. Matthew 11 and 22, uh, those four words are probably uh, some of the most important words in, in my life, the, the, some of the uh, most go-to words in Scripture for me. Matthew 11 and 22 begins with this, have faith in God, right? Now, now allow me to kind of paint the historical setting 
uh, and scene uh, of Mark uh, 11. Uh, we are in Mark 11. We begin with the triumphal entry of Jesus on that Sunday, the last week of his earthly life, right? On the next morning, that Monday, on his way uh, back to Jerusalem, right from Bethany, Jesus sees a fig tree, a tree with leaves on it. He stopped to see if it might have fruit, but it did not. So he cursed it for not having fruit. Now, I want you to know something. Uh, uh, he cursed it uh, not so much simply because it didn't have fruit, but it gave the impression of having fruit by having leaves. In other words, uh, th the warning here is that uh, the tree by having leaves was claiming to have something that it did not, right? Uh, th that, that, that is a part of that beginning portion uh, as we deal with the fig tree that we can't miss. The fact that it had leaves, right, was an indicator that it ought to have fruit. So he stopped, saw the fig tree with leaves, stopped to see if it had fruit on it, and so the curse, curse came because it gave the impression by having leaves of having something that it did not, right? On that same day, that Monday, Jesus clean, cleansed the temple, right? Uh, in the corner of the court uh, of the Gentiles there in the temple, it had been changed uh, into a place uh, where they sold cattle and sheep. And it was also a place where they exchanged uh, money, right? For, uh, and, and so Jesus uh, rebuked them or was upset because they had taken a sacred area, right? Uh, something that was supposed to be a house of prayer uh, and turned it into a secular area or a den of robbers. Right? So, so that's Monday. But on Tuesday morning, all right, as Jesus and the disciples are returning to the city, returning to Jerusalem from Bethany, right, Peter noticed the fig tree that they saw on Monday. And he said, Lord, that fig tree has withered, right? And, and from that, Jesus proceeds to teach uh, them and us a lesson on faith, all right? Now, talks about our having full faith in God, right? Uh, it, it talks about the great possibilities uh, of faith and begins with what we might call the command of faith, right? Uh, have faith in God. In the Greek, it means uh, have faith of God, right? Now, what it means is have God's faith or uh, the faith which God gives, all right? Uh, in Ephesians 2 and 8, we, we come to understand that faith is a gift uh, of God. And so uh, the literal meaning of have faith in God is literally have a faith of God, have God's faith or the faith that God gives. Faith is a gift from God. So we are to have faith in God. Listen, faith in anything or anyone else spells for you and I inevitable disappointment, right? Uh, th this text also uh, has us to focus on the character of faith. In other words, shall not doubt uh, in our hearts. Faith, my friends, is a firm conviction that what God has promised, he will do, right? Uh, this idea of removing mountains, right? Uh, was a Jewish figure of speech uh, uh, for getting rid of great difficulties, right? And we understand that faith must be constant. Believers ought to literally keep on believing. This is the key to dispel doubt. Uh, it is about being constant in prayer. But then he also talks about the condition of faith, right? Uh, in this word, forgive, right? Uh, Faith without forgiveness is, Im is, is impossible, uh, but, 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 must bear, uh, but we must bear our hearts before God if we expect him to hear and also to answer our, uh, our, uh, our prayer, right? Uh, and so, uh, uh, very quickly again, let me look at these verses that I read, verse 22, 23, and 24, uh, and deal with three elements. Right? We're going to deal with the expectation of faith, right? 
then secondly, the element of faith, and then finally, I will end with the evidence of faith. Going back uh, to verse 22, the expectation of faith. Now, again, in verse 21, Peter points out the withered fig tree to the Lord, right? Here's the connection. Jesus says, in connection to that, have faith in God. He wanted Peter to understand that faith in God could cause him to witness things like this all the time. Peter was amazed that Jesus spoke words over the tree. The next day, the fig tree was withered, and he said, Lord, look, uh, that tree you cursed has withered. Uh, the Lord was literally telling Peter, Peter, don't be so amazed, right? Uh, you ought to expect great things of me and from me all the time. God expects us to have faith. God expects us to meet life situations with faith. Have you ever asked yourself the question, uh, why does God give us faith as a gift, right? Again, Ephesians 2 and 8 uh, says that faith is a gift of God. Well, primarily within the context of Ephesians chapter 2, when it talks about uh, how that we've been saved by faith, not of works, so that no one can boast. And then Paul really lays out, right, how we were dead in sin and trespasses, but uh, the Spirit of God has quickened and made us alive. And so primarily, God gives us the gift of faith so that we can hear the Word of God that ultimately leads to our salvation, right? Uh, that enables us, that gift of faith, being able to hear uh, the Word of God and understand just what Jesus has done for us in our life, that gift of faith uh, enables us uh, to be saved, to confess Christ as our Lord and Savior. But then beyond that, right, God expects us to have faith to meet every life situation. We need faith to be saved, and we need faith to understand that once saved, right, that God is going to keep us secure, that God is going to sustain and God is going to provide for us. Faith in God will not allow difficulties to get the best of us, right? Uh, without faith, we would allow the difficulties in our life to get the best of us. But God gives us the gift of faith so that those things that we face in life don't overwhelm us, they don't overcome us, and they don't get the best of us. So, we will then face them with belief that God is able to deal with them, right? But also, as, as it says, have faith in God. Listen, it is not saying that we ought to have faith in faith. It is not saying that we ought to have faith in formulas. Nor is it saying we ought to have faith in faith, in, in, in ourselves. But we ought to have faith in God. And so here's a question. What or who is your faith focus, right? Who is the object of your faith? Verse 22 answers that question. Uh, the, the faith, our faith focus is God. Uh, God is the object of our faith, all right? But then verse 23 uh, deals with the elements of faith. And notice, by way of a, a figure of speech, uh, these three verses deal with figs, uh, mountain, and sea. Figs, mountain, and sea. So as we look in verse 23 uh, and explore this idea of the elements of faith, our second point, Jesus moves from the fig tree scenario to the mountain and sea example, right? Figs, mountain, sea. Uh, so Jesus moves from the fig tree scenario to the mountain and sea example. Figuratively, Jesus was now telling his followers to go and cast the mountains of the world into the sea. I say figuratively because the key to this text is the size of the mountain, right? Figuratively. Uh, the mountain was much larger than the fig tree. We know that. And the point is, it does not matter. Uh, the focus should be on the obstacle of faith should not be on the obstacle of faith, but the object of, uh, of faith. Now, here's what I want us to understand. The mountain was much bigger than the fig tree, right? 
so Jesus gives us an example of a fig that he has cursed, right, and a mountain that we can cast into the sea, right? Uh, the mountain uh, is uh, what might be considered a difficulty or an obstacle. Uh, Jesus is trying to really develop and mature our faith focus. The focus should not be on the obstacle of faith, but on the object of faith, right? Uh, God is greater than both the mountain and the fig, right? So, an element of faith is embracing the fact that our God is greater than anything we face. We have a fact-based faith. Uh, the fact is that God is able, right? A wonderful example and lesson coming from uh, the book of Numbers, the fourth book of the Bible, when uh, the 12 spies were sent out. Uh, two spies, Joshua and Caleb, came back with a good report. Uh, the other 10 spies came back saying, we can't do it. Here is the distinction. Joshua and Caleb were focused on the object of faith, God. The 10 spies were focused on the obstacle of faith. Here's the lesson. Uh, our faith focus must be on God and not on the obstacle whether that be a fig, mountain, or sea, right? So uh, another element of faith is never uh, doubting God's, God's ability, right? Uh, and so here, here are the elements of faith, primarily uh, in verse 23, the A part. N now we move to verse 23, the B part, uh, and dealing with verse 24 as we talk about the evidence of faith. Now, with faith and prayer combined, uh, you can receive the desires of your heart, right? Uh, with faith and prayer combined, you can receive the desires of your heart. Now, notice the movement, right? God will bless us when we demonstrate faith. And the element, the evidence comes when the elements exist, right? Uh, so the evidence comes when the elements exist. So uh, what does it mean to take God at his word? Uh, listen to the words of Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, uh, and it will be opened to you. Uh, listen to the words of uh, the Gospel of St. John, chapter 15, and verse 7. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in me, you, you will ask uh, whatever you desire. You shall ask whatever you will and you will get whatever you desire. It will be done for you, right? But then we also see in Psalm 37, and in Psalm 37, uh, I want to call our attention to verses 4 uh, and 5. Psalm 37, 4 and 5. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will bring it to pass. Here's a question. Uh, is your heart right? In other words, if your heart is not right, do not expect the desires. But the Lord plainly says here, when your heart is right, you can expect to receive the desires of your heart. Now, how do we get the heart right? He, he, he concludes in verse 24 by saying, one of the things you got to do is you got to be willing to forgive, right? You have to get uh, unforgiveness out of your heart. That, that's one of the ways we get our uh, heart right. We want God to create in us a uh, clean heart and uh, renew within us a, a right spirit. That's why the Bible places so much emphasis on our heart and why there is always a connection between our praying and receiving desires. That connecting link is the status or state of our heart. When we are constantly in communication with God, when we are spending time with God, asking uh, God to examine us and uh, cleanse us, and uh, if he finds anything that should not be, uh, simply uh, take it out because we see the fulfillment of Matthew 7 and 7 and 
John 15 and 7, which is, encourages us uh, to abide in him. In Psalm 37, 4 and 5, uh, when our heart is right, right, we, we know that our desires will be according, certainly, to the will, to the will of God. So, uh, very extensively, right, uh, Mark chapter 11, 22, 23, and 24, uh, give us a wonderful lesson, if you will, uh, in, uh, in the power of faith and helping us to understand that God is the object of our faith and we should face, put our focus on the object and not certainly the obstacles to our faith. We know that there will be many obstacles uh, that come along our way, but no matter the obstacle, my friends, we ought to keep our faith focused on, on God. All right? Uh, that concludes our lesson. Uh, certainly uh, for today, uh, coming from uh, Mark 11, uh, 22, 23, and 24. Thank you for joining us. I, I will conclude uh, certainly in prayer. Uh, at the very beginning, certainly I reminded us that we want to keep our thoughts and most importantly our prayers uh, for those who are still recovering from Hurricane Helene, but now are in the path, uh, even some uh, of Hurricane Milton. Uh, also, uh, if you'll focus, even after I pray, uh, you'll see some announcements and information about our church, uh, just simply about who we are, uh, when we worship, uh, when we have Bible study, ways you can connect with our church, uh, ways you can give to our church, and also some upcoming uh, events. Father in heaven, we come and thank you for this wonderful day that you've made. We endeavor to rejoice and to be glad in this day all day long. And at the end of our day, God, we purpose in our heart to look back and simply to reflect and focus on how good you have been to us uh, throughout uh, this certain day. Father, we lift our hearts and prayers uh, to those on the western coast and shores of Florida, particularly in the Tampa, Sarasota area, uh, who may be facing uh, a very torrential storm here very soon, or we'll be facing uh, a very torrential storm here very soon. God, we pray for their safety, for their covering. Pray, God, even for those emergency personnel uh, who will be making sure that those who could not evacuate, God, are, are kept safe uh, and are also saved. Father, we thank you for blessing us with the gift of a day. And God, we pray that whatever we set our hands to do within this day, that we do it all for the glory of God. We pray, God, for any sick, uh, for any needs that may exist in our midst. While we're not able to chronicle or know everything, we know, God, that you know all things. And as we pray and as we intercede, you're able to meet the needs of those who are calling out to you, certainly in prayer. Father, continue to bless this, our church, as we remain faithful to your word in teaching uh, and faithful to you in worship each and every Sunday. We pray, God, for the members of this great church. Uh, God, we thank you that you even are uh, leading us even close to celebrating 125 years of faithful existence as a local church. We pray for our guests, our visitors. Thank you, God, for their presence uh, and for tuning in to our Bible study. Now, God, bless us. Keep us as only you can. In the mighty and wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen.